Hopefully, uh, you guys did a better job of reading uh, this summer than I did. Uh, I did not read very much at all. I think I read this chapter, and that was it. Uh, but uh, um, just to kind of get ahead. But uh, uh, thank you guys again for being here. Um, I know it's relatively early. It's not early at all for me. But uh, for some of you, it's a, it's a chore to get out of bed, and that's okay. Uh, and... Uh, here comes my dad. <laughs> Call him out for everyone. Hey, dad. Hey, dad. Uh, no, but uh, uh, thank you. Thanks again for coming. Um, John and I uh, are still blown away by how many guys show up and uh, how um, how excited you guys are for the start of this uh, each week. And so, um, uh, I know John will probably say more about it, but. Uh, um, you know, as we as we go through this, um, just remember that this is the, the point of the of these studies and, and reading theology and understanding it is is not for a mental exercise, but but to bring us to a closer relationship with who Jesus is and uh, and understanding of what um, what He desires out of us. And uh, Aaron Wagner's here. Aaron. Morning, Aaron. Go ahead. Um, yeah, but uh, so let me pray for us. Uh, we've got a uh, we've got a lot to get to um, over the next couple of weeks with. Uh, um, uh, over the next few weeks uh, with uh, God's providence, and uh, so let me pray for us, and then we'll get started. Father God, Lord, I thank you for our time this morning. Uh, Father, I thank you for uh, all of these men and, and uh, their desire to uh, to be here, to fellowship with one another. Lord, uh, I just pray that, uh, uh, Lord, that you would speak through John this morning as he uh, continues to teach us um, and uh, give him the words to say. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Josh. Good morning, man. It's good to be back together. Four months went by fast, didn't it? Like really fast. It's good to be able to gather. Yeah, I, I missed it this summer. It's good to take a break sometimes, but I didn't miss it. It's good to get uh, started up again. And we are uh, we are going to hit the ground running today, not like we did when we started back in January with sort of a soft start with an introduction. We're going to hit the ground running with some heavy topics as we run right into the start with chapter 16, God's providence. Uh, more on that in a minute. This is this is my favorite chapter out of all 52 chapters in the whole book. Is this one? And uh, I, on a schedule, I, I think I, I wrote down we could do this in two weeks. It may take for me, but that's fine. We'll uh, we'll just we'll stop at a good time today, and we'll see how far we get, and uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. But I think we can do it in two. But it may take it may take three weeks. Uh, I want to put uh, we'll 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 share. Our, this presentation with you every single week and our emails are on there. If you have any questions, just want to make sure that you guys know where our contact information is. Most of you are on the email chain. I know we've got some people that have been here before, so welcome. I uh, want to make sure that you've got a question or a comment or just want to reach out and touch base on anything that we discuss. want to make sure you guys have our uh, contact information. And please do. Please feel free to reach out at any time if you have a question, comment, concern, prayer request. Uh, we welcome that and uh, we'd love to that dialogue with you. Uh, these, uh, we, these are heavy, some of these, it's heavy topics, isn't it? This morning's topic is heavy. And uh, so if you have a question, please reach out. Uh, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to start as we usually do. Uh, we're going to start with a discussion topic. And then I'll, I'm going to do maybe 10 minutes of just introduction just because it's been four months. And I think it's good to have a reminder, and Josh mentioned this, is why we do this. Uh, it's not just an intellectual pursuit. Uh, but that we want to know more of who our God is, and uh, this should push us back to the Scriptures, because this is our ultimate source, not the theology book. The room would say the same thing, not about me. I'm pushing you back to the source, that is the Scriptures, and to know who our God is. And so let's back this up, because maybe I just answered some of the question, but I'll let you answer this in a personal way. So when every time we do this the first time, make sure you introduce yourself around the table. So this is the first time you want to share something about just you are, I'll give maybe three or four minutes for this first round, and then let's just go back to answer. This is the first question we asked back in January when we started chapter one, is why, why a theology class? Why come here on a Saturday morning? 
why do this? Why get out of bed early on a weekend when most people are sleeping in? Why take a theology class? So go ahead, table discussion time. I'll put a few minutes, so put four minutes on the timer. Let's go around, introduce yourself, share something about yourself, and let's talk about that first question. Go ahead.
Alright guys, do you want to change up your last comment? I see you guys uh, yeah. Yeah. Share out. So, we discussed this when we first started. So why a theology class? Why are we here this morning on a Saturday morning? You can share your idea or maybe something else to so share at your table, but let's just share out some of our ideas. Why, why a theology class? Why are we here? So I like how the other one here is, if I believe this, and I, I put my faith in it, I need to understand it better to build my life around that. And, and one way is not only just reading this or preaching, but also digging into it. Yeah, I like Chad, you held up the Bible to say that, so we understand that's the good purpose to understand the scriptures. But, you know, I build my life around it, I like that practical application. What else? Why theology class, guys? Yeah, very similar to uh, Chad's table over there. It's just uh, uh, understanding the scriptures better, something that you, uh, with placing your faith in uh, Jesus alone and being able to uh, proclaim that to other people, and it's just a really good uh, um, class to be able to uh, uh, break it down, break down the scriptures and understand them better. So when you, um, when you relate those, uh, relate God's love to others, um, you you have you know the confidence you're you're it's not that you were lacking it before but you 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 know where to go you have a better understanding your relationship with Jesus grows even more and uh, the more you know somebody just like you know my dad you know I wouldn't know him very well if I didn't hang out with him if I didn't speak to him if I didn't if we didn't do things together. And everything. So this is kind of falls in that in that same category. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, you said a lot there. You know Jesus better, and to give us confidence in sharing with others. There's a lot to do. Thank you. Good words. How about one more. You have a God that's without limits, and uh, we have to do our part to learn more about Him. And uh, if, if we don't take the time to spend in Scripture, we don't take the time of going to classes like this and diving deeper, we won't grow, yeah. and uh, it's, it's ongoing. <laughs> Our life should be filled with theology classes. Yeah, okay. right. good, well said. Yeah, there's a, we could go on with the answering this for for a long time if we wanted to, there's, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's well said, it's we, we serve an infinite and limitless God. Yes, we do. It's, sometimes we forget that, don't we? we? Time will go by, and it's we need those reminders of exactly who our God is, and to learn more and more about it. That's why we're here. You guys said it, and uh, again, I appreciate the time you spend to come. And I know that uh, for me, it uh, I get, I grow in the in preparation as you do. Or any, anyone who's taught a class, you know that the, whoever is teaching it, it's probably spent a whole lot of time preparing it. So I get a lot out of it, and it keeps me accountable too for my own studies. So I really appreciate the fact that you guys are here and we're able to do this. In community with one another because certainly you all have the book you can stay home and read it yourself yes and so there's that community piece too is why do we gather together to do this and that is because again I think you think the same with our small groups correct but, uh, why we have to go to we have the Bible we could read it but there's something about when followers of Christ we gather together and the scriptures tell us that God is present with us even now which is an amazing thought as we do this to learn more about it is there's power in this community and that uh, we do this in fellowship with one another together and so lots of reasons to come here and I'm glad you guys are here uh, Scott shared this uh, link with um, Josh and I this summer and uh, it's called the State of Theology 2020 survey so every two years Lifeway and RC schools ministry get together to ask questions of people in general and those who are self state that they are evangelicals and so this is just to see what's the climate, the cultural climate of different questions. So I put the link on here. If you get a chance, click on that and just go through it. It's really interesting. You can go back. I think they've got, I don't know when they started. I think it was, we've been doing it for four cycles, so eight years. But you can see kind of some trends. They ask the same questions generally. It's kind of fascinating. And then you can filter it by those who claim to be evangelicals. And you can do it by gender, age, and all sorts of backgrounds. And it's, it's interesting to look at the data. So here's, I just put two questions out here, and this is what evangelical, it's important, this is what evangelical stated. Jesus was a great teacher, uh, but he was not God. So 
of those who may be evangelical said agreed with that statement. They agreed or somewhat agreed. I think, really? That seems to be kind of the easier one. It's, they claim the evangelical state, stated that. And then there's another one. Jesus is the first and greatest being created by God. Almost 40% of evangelicals agree to that. And I don't know if they got hung up on the wording of that question. Maybe that he's the first and greatest. But we'll study later on that was Jesus a created being? That point's been argued in church history for 2,000 years. The answer is no. We've been studying in our small groups today book of John, right there in John 1.1, 1, 1, that he was with God and he is God. He was there in all of creation. And though we serve that word that is eternal, and that's where to get into the Trinity. But no, Jesus was not created by God. He exists co-eternally with the Father and the Spirit. That's the mystery of the Trinity. More on that later, I keep saying that. We'll get to the Trinity later. Uh, so, uh, this is why we study theology, right? To correct doctrinal errors, too. We, we want to be correct in our thinking. And sometimes what seems right to me as a human being may not be what the scriptures state. And so we always have to tell ourselves, what does the Bible teach? What, does the, what do the scriptures say? And so we, we don't want to be victims of doctrinal error. So it's good to, the knowledge piece is, is good. Purpose of our class, again, we need to move beyond just an intellectual pursuit. So seminary students will tell you that's a bad thing. You don't want to look at the Bible. They study the Greek. They study historical context. They study, study, study. We have to be careful. We don't allow this just to be a intellectual pursuit, just to gain knowledge for knowledge's sake alone. Because the Bible tells us that that is not useful just for knowledge's sake alone. Even the demons believe and they fear, they shudder. So that knowledge's sake, it has to be more than just intellectual. Because being here, this again should drive us to study the scriptures, to know more about our God, and that our hearts and our minds and lives would be transformed by what we do. So just uh, the overview of the book, again, it's written from a Reformed theology position, Calvinist position, more on that later, but I really appreciate Grudem. He presents a fair and balanced overview of beliefs that are here in the evangelical world right now. Uh, we'll talk more about what that means in Calvinist position later, but he does. He does present it very fairly. He'll say, this is what I hold to, but this is what other evangelicals might hold to on this topic as well. He does. I think he does a good job of that. And here's our initial assumptions, and this is it. This is our foundation for our truth and our study. One, this is right from the book. Uh, again, I, if I put page numbers on here, it's different. I've got an electronic version, so depending on what size of you put the text on your screen, the page numbers are completely off. I know some of you have the first edition of the book, some of you have the 2020 edition, but, so some of the page numbers might be off. This is what Gruden says. Here's our assumptions. The Bible is true and is, in fact, our only absolute standard of truth. And second, the God who is spoken of in the Bible exists. He is who the Bible says he is, the creator of heaven and earth and all things in them. But that first statement is this, is this is where we get all of our information. This is our standard of truth right here. Again, it's so critical we understand that not a human being writing a theology book. There's hundreds of theology books that have been written over the past 2,000 years, literally, uh, if not more. And so the Bible is our source of truth. So we'll, we'll continue with the same format that we always have been, our study, our questions. There's terms that uh, each chapter gives. Uh, there's a scripture memory for those. We're not going to focus on that just because it gets overwhelming, but if you want to keep up with that, he does give a, a uh, scripture memory that uh, goes with the topic we're studying. And then we'll end with a hymn and a praise song. Not this time, we'll pick that up again uh, next week. And then... The book is a resource. You can't possibly get through all the information. So if those who want to do more study, if you go to the end of the chapter, you'll see a whole list of topics by different denominations who have addressed it. And so there's really dozens upon dozens of further readings if you have a topic of interest to you, and it's a great resource. Our sections of the book are this. We finished uh, the Doctrine of the Word of God. That's what we started with. I think there was nine chapters, eight chapters. And right now, we're right in the middle of the doctrine of God or of theology proper. So we've got the other sections coming. Uh, I don't know if we'll finish this this year, uh, but we'll get close to it. Uh, and you can you can see they've got the, the fancy names are on the right, and then the topics are on the left. The class plan is, so we'll try to do a chapter a week, but we'll hit a chapter like this, which I think is impossible to do in our, in our hour time limits. 
So again, I think we can do it in two, but it may be three, and that's okay. Try to do your best to read the chapter before Saturday. It'll help a lot coming, just for discussion's sake. Review the questions that are there. He gives some really good personal application questions. And again, there's an online option too. You've got a digital copy of the book if you want it, and uh, the videos are recorded with uh, the Stoneberg families. Worked very hard to get these on their YouTube channel. And if you want to participate live, there's also that uh, Ring Central link to If you can't make it, feel free to log in. Uh, if you want to, we're traveling. That's, uh, what's that? that's what that is for. Here's our fall schedule. Uh, we will take off for the men's retreat, which is coming in two weeks, just because so many of us are going to be up there. Uh, but uh, you can see this is the schedule for part two, the doctrine of God. Right now, we're going to finish that either end of October or the first Saturday in November, depending on how far we get today. Our class expectations. So here's what we promised to do. This is our guidelines for this class. So we will start on time every day right at 7 a.m. sharp, and I'll do my best to end on time. Uh, one of the benefits of doing this on a Saturday morning is it usually doesn't uh, overlap any of our, our busy lives and our kids' events and soccer games and baseball and all of that. Uh, most of our families are, aren't getting up this early on a Saturday. So we'll do our best to end at 8 o'clock or just a few minutes thereafter. We'll do our best to do that. Uh, we need to make sure that all of us, we give grace in areas of disagreement. Uh, let's make sure we always respond in love, and we will disagree with some topics. It really, we will, depending on our, our backgrounds and uh, where we've come from. We may disagree on some topics, and that's okay. Just we need to show humility, all of us, myself included, uh, as we grow together. Some other resources here. This I'll leave this up here for you. If uh, yeah, Grudem's got those theology podcasts, anyone actually listen to those, where he recorded his Sunday school class at his church in Arizona. So many raising in your hand here. Those are, if, if he goes through the whole book, and he, I found, I, I listened to them when I was driving to work. It took a while because I think there's over 100. Uh, there's a lot. And uh, but he's recorded himself teaching his own material from a Sunday school class from years ago. But it's really great to do that. They're free on any of your podcasts, whatever format you use. Then if you want to look, those of you who are attenders of this church, We've got our VBC distinctive link. I put that up to our website, and also, of course, our own doctrinal statement for Village Bible Church. Uh, also, a good resource too, especially if you're an attender of this church. Uh, but those links are there for you as well. Uh, just some by way of again continuing our introduction. Systematic theology. What is it? It's just studying in an organized way by topic. So that's that word systematic. There's a structure to it. You saw the sections of the book. We're going through in a systematic and organized way studying theology. It's important to differentiate between major doctrines and minor doctrines. All are important doctrines, but a major doctrine is one that has a significant impact on our way of thinking. You've got some of them listed up here, Trinity, Deity of Christ, uh, sinfulness of all of us. So these are major doctrines, the inerrancy of Scripture, and there's more. And then there's minor doctrines, and minor doctrines, one that has less or little impact. Now, you could argue that end times should be maybe a major. This was Grudem's put it here. And I know that uh, we said this before, is that the church historically, especially the fundamentalist church from the 60s and 50s and 60s, had elevated end times to be the, the most prominent of all doctrines. And we've seen that probably was not the right place to elevate that. Uh, I'll give an example. Our church constitution, the original here at Village Bible Church, one-third of the, con the original constitution addressed in times, because that was culturally in the church, that was just a heavy topic in the 60s and the 70s, and really even in the, say, the 50s too. And again, it's an important doctrine. I don't know if I put it in the same level as some of the ones we mentioned earlier. And then here's another example of the Lord's Supper. We know we're commanded to participate in the communion table. How we do that, or even should you use wine or juice? And depending on your background, if you come from a Lutheran background, uh, or even a Catholic background, it, the communion table is a very, very key part of every worship service. And we practice it the first Sunday of every month. Any of the point is, there's some freedom in the scriptures of how we practice it. And churches have to come decide that. But I wouldn't elevate that to a major doctrine status. And last is this, before we start our study. Theology versus ethics. So biblical theology, what we're studying is what we believe, right? These are our core beliefs, what we believe. Ethics is how we live it out. And that's a difference because this is not an ethics class, even though sometimes there's some overlap. So Grudem said this, what does the whole Bible teach us? This is what Christian ethics are. 
What does the whole Bible teach us about which acts, attitudes, and character traits receive God's approval, which do not? So here's an example of some ethics. In biblical marriage, you can read these social justice, what do Christians do about war, divorce, racism, capital punishment. Uh, what These are how we live out what we believe. That's ethics. And so we're going to do our best to keep that as a side note because it's easy to get off onto those topics, correct? But that's not what the focus of a theology class is. We're going to focus more, we'll focus on what we believe. All right. Let's talk about God's providence. Again, this is my favorite chapter in this whole book, and I'm not sure what you thought of it, but this has had great personal meaning to me years ago when I first read it, and it really changed. It, God used it to open my heart personally into who he is, and then that changed a lot of my thinking about the world around me. And I'm gonna get, I'll give a personal story about that in just a minute. But let's talk about what God's providence is. This is what Grudem states, and he divides this chapter into three sections. We're going to get through at least two of them this morning, maybe, and then we'll save next week's C for next week. But here's, what he, here's the definition, according to Grudem, of God's providence, his sovereignty, is this. God is continually involved with all created things, in such a way that he, here we go, A, B, and C, there they are, that he first keeps them existing and maintaining the properties with which he created them, that's called preservation. B, the second one, that he cooperates with created things in every action, that's us and beyond, directing their distinctive properties to cause them to act as they do. we got to think about that, we're going to talk about that, he causes them to act as they do, that's called concurrence, there's the fancy word for that. And then C, we won't get to this today, but he directs them to fulfill his own purposes. That's government. And so that's the definition of God's providence. We're going to jump right into with A, hopefully get to B, and then we're going to get into the question of evil today, too. I said we'd uh, hit the ground running today. We are, because there's an obvious question that comes up, isn't there, that if God causes us to act as we do, if he's sovereign over his creation, then there's an obvious question that comes up, isn't it? But if God does that, then why is there such terrible suffering and evil in this world? That is a good question to ask. And that comes up if you read the Lord's Room, spends a lot of time on that. And then we'll hit C next week. So let's go back to uh, part one. Here's the, here's the division, as we said. We'll do preservation and concurrence. If God is sovereign over his creation, then why is there human suffering? Then next week we get into government. What is God's relationship to the willing choices of moral creatures then? If we act according to his purposes, so what's the big question that always comes up with uh, next week? To translate that, what is that? The, what's the discussion over for next week? If God causes us to act, then we have to ask that question as human beings. Then what? Do I have free will? Do I have a free will? Correct. Like, there's a what? How does that work? If God's causing me to act, do I make my own choices? Do my choices that I make as a moral creature they even matter? So that's another good question to ask. These are heavy topics, aren't they? We'll try to hit that next week or the following. So let's go back and look at preservation first. Uh, so understanding this topic, God's sovereignty, in reference to his character, this is important. We spent a lot of time in chapters 11, 12, and 13 discussing who God is. And there's a reason why this book is structured the way it is. They don't start out with chapter 16. Now, they could do that because this is truth. But I think it's really important that we go back and remember that God is sovereign with the filter of who he is and his character, and that he does not change. All of these things we learn about who our God is, that when we're going through those chapters, just makes us stand back and just be in awe of who our God is. But his sovereignty is always in line with his character. So what do we mean by that? So there was two characters, there was two there was two uh, aspects of who our God is. There was aspects of his character that's unique only to him, and there's other aspects of his character that he has shared with us. So let's take a let's let's go back and do a little uh, review. What were some of those characteristics that God has that are unique to him that are not us? Well, does anybody recall what some of those were? We think for a minute. Where's sir? What's that? He's eternal. He is eternal. It's great. Okay. It's unchanging. He is unchanging, immutable, good. What else? He's love. Okay, he is love. Now, actually, that's one he has shared with us because he does it perfectly, but we have the capacity to love as well, and we receive love and give. God has shared that with us. He just does it a whole lot better than we do. 
Correct. Okay. How about uh, what else? Omnipresent. He's omnipresent. He is everywhere at all places and at all times. There's never a time where God is not. Yeah. Omniscient. He's omniscient. He knows everything and not just, here's what's amazing about his he knows all. It's not that he knows everything. He also knows what could have been. So think about that too. Think of one, he knows every possibility, everything. There's nothing. He's infinite in his knowledge. I think that's an amazing fact too. He knows what is. He knows what could be. There's nothing, no knowledge he does not have. Okay, good. Now let's talk about Chris Love. What are some other aspects of who our God is that, he, that we have he shared with us in creation as well? One, love was one. What, what else? Mercy. Mercy, yes, good. God shows infinite mercy to us. We can show mercy as well, yet we fail in that, don't we? We, just, we don't do it the way God does. Because of sin. What else? Grace. Grace, good. God shows us grace, infinite grace, and salvation. And we can show grace to others too, good. Think of the fruits of the Spirit. Okay, we have those characteristics as well. I bring this up because I think if we remember who our God is, that really helps me to understand the discussions we're about to have with God's providence that He is sovereign. That, uh, that when we talk about the question, why is there evil? Why do terrible things happen in this world? Because they do. Right? Does God call me to suffer? Why? If he directs all that, and then, and then that really helps with that background to understand that deep question. And so I bring that up because it's through the lens of God's character that we study his sovereign will, and that's important. Any questions or comments on, on that before we move on? So here's a discussion question. Why is understanding God's sovereignty over his creation key to studying theology? Because of time, I think we'll just kind of talk about this together. So that's an important question. And it was an important question for me when I first, I think, studied this chapter years ago, and it meant so much to me. Uh, because I think we have a tendency as human beings to default what makes sense to me as a human instead of going back to the scriptures, but what do the scriptures say? I'll say that again. We have a tendency to default to what makes sense to me as a human, because I think that makes more sense. But yet we go to the scriptures, what do the scriptures say? We're going to look at some examples of that. And I'm going to give a personal a personal story from my life. I shared this before about my daughter and how a conversation I had with her when she was five years old, really, and I was reading this chapter at the same time that really just... I had to wrestle with it, and I'll go back a little bit. So our, our third daughter, Angelina, has severe chronic eczema. And so lots of people have eczema, right? But they, very few people have it the way she does. It's an autoimmune issue. And what happens is her, our skin is a barrier against all sorts of infection, bacteria. Her skin is, because of its, it's cracked, so that infection and, and bacteria can get inside. So what happens is it causes super infections. MRSA can get in, and so she spent weeks in the hospital. There was one time she almost she almost lost her foot. Uh, she was, like, uh, second grade, maybe. Uh, she spent on two and a half weeks of DuPage because they couldn't get this infection out of her. So this is something she's had since she's about three years old. And I remember one night, because the kids, she'll scratch it. If anybody has, has children or family with severe eczema, they scratch at night, the sheets are bloody the morning. It's not, it's, 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 it's a rough disease for a kid, it really is. So I remember one night we were talking her in and she said, Dad, could God take eczema away if he wanted to? And so you can see what's coming. And of course, I said, well sure, maybe he can do that if he wants. He's God. And of course, what, what was her next question to me as a little kid? Oh, I asked my husband, well, why doesn't he? So I remember the, my thought was I was ready to come back with the elder of the church answer, right? And you know what the first thing that ran through my head then was? Yeah, God, why don't you? Yeah, that's, and, and I, I think any of you who have gone through tragedy or, or times of, of suffering or just heartache, we've all come to that place, right? Yeah, God, what are you doing? Why? Why did this happen? And with anger and grief and just crying out, we've all been to that place, haven't we? Why is this happening? And so... I remember walking away from that. I did give some answer to her because I might leave a five-year-old hanging in despair before she goes to bed. But I remember walking away troubled by that whole exchange, that quick exchange with my daughter because I 
had to wrestle with that. God, why, why don't you take it away? I did not have a settled feeling in my heart to respond to my own daughter about that. And I actually found myself upset by that. And I remember we were reading this chapter. I don't know if I was reading it then or shortly after going through this. And I remember wrestling with that theologically. And I, I, it was good for me to do that. It was a little unsettling too. But this chapter meant a lot to me because here's what I had to come and realize. And this is where we're going to end up with this chapter is that, is that I'm not in control of what happens to my children. I'm not. And as, a, as men in this room, as, as fathers, we want to put, especially when our kids are little, but at all times, we want to put up walls around them to keep all trouble out of their lives, right? That's what we do. We want to protect. We want to, we want to encase them in that nothing's going to hurt them, that we're going to keep them safe, that no other person will do anything bad to them. They're not going to get sick. They're going to be just fine, and we can sleep at night when the kids are all there and safe, and that's good. But the reality is, we don't get to do that. And so it, what ended up happening is, I don't want to get too far ahead, is I had to come to the conclusion that she doesn't, my kid Angie does not belong to me. She belongs to the God who created her, and he has the right to do with his purpose as he wants. Now, if we stop with that statement alone, if I, if I put that statement on a screen out of context, it seems like a harsh statement, doesn't it? So, you, so there's, this is why I go back to the characteristics of who our God is, because that's a, that's a harsh statement to write, just deal with it. It's, God can do what he wants. Now, you can say, all right, that's a true statement in and of itself, but that statement does not exist in a vacuum. It doesn't exist outside of the character of who our God is, because that same God, and this is the amazing thing, man, who, who does cause everything to will and act according to his purposes, also loves my daughter, has a purpose, has promised this, that there is hope, there is peace, there is good that will come of everything that he does. That is his sovereignty that I had to wrestle with. So I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but that's the place I had to come to. That even though this is hard, I know God, I trust you. Now have faith in this, that you know what you're doing by allowing this to happen to her. And even though it's hard, and you know what, it could get worse. So I say that in this room with men who have buried their children. I say that in this room with men who have watched their children have multiple surgeries and wondered how much what's going to happen in the future. And so those are heavy statements. So this, this is a real statement that is not just words. As followers of Christ and as Christians, we have to wrestle with God's honor. We have to. We have to be at peace with that, that God is in control and that we can trust him. And I think, in my opinion, this is where faith matters. That's real faith. I think you've heard Tim talk, our pastor, if you don't go here, talk many times about his own father, who's a pastor, buried their 17 or 18 year old son, the senior year of high school. Yeah, they had to go to the morgue and identify them. I mean, that's, this is their, they had to bury their son. They, and it's still to say, through the tears and all of that, that God, you're good. And I think back, we've got that example from 3,000 years ago or more with uh, Job in the Old Testament too, who says the exact same thing. And so that is why the sovereignty of God matters. And then the second piece of this, this is the foundation for understanding the rest of our study. Because when we get into doctrines like election, when we get into doctrines uh, talking about God's choosing, it has to be with that context. We understand that, yes, he does. But it isn't, God is not, it's not a deist approach. God's not a kid with an ant farm who says this and watches his things happen, but he's not in control of it, not at all. It's that he is, and that he is who he says he is, he loves us, uh, and he's faithful to us, and we can trust him. So that's that's my personal connection to this, and I hope as we and you study this, that we wrestle with this as well, and that uh, we have are able to be at peace with that because we have to, because we have to let go and let God be who He is, and trust in that that He is good. And so these are heavy topics. So I think uh, it's just this is this is what we must understand as we. Forward, and I hope that you're able to wrestle with some of these issues too. So let's continue. So let's jump into our study. Yeah, we're definitely going to be here three weeks, maybe four. <laughs> That's okay. Preservation, this will be the first one. Here's the definition God keeps all created things existing and maintaining the properties with which He created them. Uh, 
so again, God keeps all created things existing and maintaining the properties with which he created them. So Hebrews 1.3 says this, that he is the radiance, Jesus, the glory of God, and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Everything he set into motion, he keeps in motion. And God maintains not just that, uh, he doesn't keep just the stars and the planets of our galaxy all aligned and rotating together, but even at the molecular level, he keeps all of these sustained. Colossians 1, 7, Teen says he's before all things and in him, in Christ, all things hold together. So it's not by accident that chapter 16, God's providence, comes right after when our big study we ended on back in May on God's creation. So God's all that means that God is also in control over all properties of matter, too. So here, let's talk about this for just a minute. So first, matter is sustained by God, so water retains its Properties of water, right? Grudem brought that up in the book. Water stays and has maintains its properties. It doesn't change. You turn on your faucet, all of a sudden the water is doing something you've never seen it do before. No, there's consistency there because it is God. If He created it, He also maintains it. Every single molecule, He's in control of all of that. Uh, everything, molecules, everything, it retains their properties and retains their properties over time. Uh, second, uh, Grudem made the point that. God preserves all properties of matter, and that creation is consistent. So in the, in the middle, we talked about this a lot too, in the middle of unimaginable complexity, there is unimaginable order too. It isn't just chaos. It isn't just that the molecules are spinning off and things are being recreated. They know there's consistency, and God holds all of that together as his creation. So the earth continues to revolve around the sun. We see it as the sun comes up every single morning, as it has since the beginning and will continue until God says differently, and things like water will always boil at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Right? There's consistency there. That doesn't change. There's consistency in God's creation. And then third one is provides a basis for science, and this is important because we can learn about our universe because God maintains order with his creation. Okay? Because it behaves in, uh, in continual and continuous ways, consistent ways, without changing. And so, let me ask this. Let's talk about science for a second, for a minute, because this fact provides a basis for science. You ever think about what is what is science? Sometimes as Christians, we fear that word a little bit, because we feel like it's constantly brought up that you can't be a Christian and believe in science at the same time, right? You have to kiss your intellect goodbye to follow Christ and the scriptures, because clearly this is not consistent with science. So let's talk about this. What is, sorry, that's the belief, we're not holding to that. What is the definition of science? What does that mean? Knowledge. Knowledge, science is knowledge, correct, good. Excellent, <laughs> they will just go with that. Science is knowledge. And as followers of Christ, where does all knowledge come from? What do we hold to? It comes from the God who created it, who we serve. So all knowledge is God's knowledge because he created everything. So we, it is not inconsistent us because we hold to that God created everything. So we learn more about the knowledge. This is what God's created about the world around us and we're learning more about God simultaneously. If you're not a follower of Christ, if you don't hold to the scripture, you can see where the two are completely different. And you put all religion on one side as that has nothing to do with science. That's a feeling. Okay, that helps people feel better about themselves. So they're not afraid of dying. And then you've got over here, you've got what it actually is true. And they're totally separate. Of course, we don't hold that. And so our definition of science is very different from a, someone who follows, does not follow Christ, correct? Okay, uh, another follow-up question. Will science ever contradict the scriptures? Ever? No. Our definition of science, the answer to that would be no, no. Well, knowledge will never contradict the scriptures. It will not. God, Though, shares, us. God, God shares that with us. God shares us what we see in science. God allows us to see what he had created and how he created it to a limit. Yeah. But right. science is interpreted by sinful man. Yes. Right? Yeah. So there's an interpretation with science right. that you would have to separate the interpretation from the core truth. Right? right? Yeah. You have to separate those two. Correct. And if it's God that provides the knowledge, yeah. then it has to be consistent yeah. with his creation. In a fundamental tip, my point. Um, our view of science 
pick up a, a science book a uh, hundred years ago, a chemistry book, and you realize a lot of things have changed because what we thought was the fact was the real violence of something that really wasn't. So in one sense, science, uh, we think of it as being a steady thing, but when, when you look back, there's a lot of things that people thought years ago, this is the way it is. Uh, look at how they used to treat people of bloodletting. You've been sick, did somebody do that to you or not? Why not? What happened? What changed? Well, we realized that that idea, uh, it seemed to work, but it really wasn't a good idea. So science really is a matter of doing something and expecting something and doing it a lot of times and usually it comes out the same way, but it doesn't always. And we do find out. All you have to do is look at your kids in the science books and maybe like I have some books that I had when I was taking science, and it was completely different. I remember the, the cell, and there was this thing that looked like a maybe a, a, a pancake and a couple little things in it. And 30 years later, I looked at my daughter's book, and it looked like a pizza, just all kinds of stuff in it. And so what, what changed? Did the cell really change? No, the cell was always what it was, what we thought. It was. Science is what we think something is. And that does change because that knowledge grows as we do more experiments. But from God's perspective, it never really changed. But what we think it is. Right. That yeah. changed. Yeah. Well said, Mike. We, we keep learning more and more and more about who our God is and His creation. He allows us to do that. So, what's the main difference between a humanist? approach and a Christian's approach when it comes to science? Uh, we have the uh, assumption of an all-powerful God overseeing the universe. Yeah. So when we look at that sunrise or sunset, going back to that example, we give thanks to God who created it. And the humanist approach has no one, there is no, there's, it just, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's pretty, I'll take a picture of it. There's no purpose or reason behind it. It's just a product of chance, and that's it. And that, uh, everything that we know now is going to be debunked 100 years from now anyways. And uh, there is no hope. There is no There is no foundation for truth. It's just uh, they're doing the best they can. And there is no acknowledgement of any type of first cause. There's no answer for that. There isn't. It's that, uh, it's, they're doing their best with the foundation of that they're, this is all by chance. And that's what they have. And again, I think we've got to be careful because we have to be careful as Christians to not do the same thing that the world does with us and say, look down our noses, but to say, if we had not had our eyes open to the truth, we would be at the same place. And so we got to be careful with us. Uh, we, they, they should cause compassion. Even if we don't receive compassion, that's okay. We should have compassion for the world around us because they're they do not understand that truth. And they look at a sunset or something beautiful in creation and have no thought of gratitude in their hearts for how the, the God who created it and created it for them to enjoy too. Okay, uh, last was gives us life and breath. Every breath we take is that uh, God gives us that. We woke up this morning and it's why it's so important to be able to be thankful for that, that God gave us this day and his purpose is we're here because God has ordained us to be here, right? He gives us every, every day of life we have. He's given it to us as a gift every moment, every breath, because guess what? Tomorrow is not guaranteed. <laughs> or is the next breath we draw is not. Uh, we don't know, but God gave us this day, and that it comes from uh, from God that uh, he gave that to us. So that's preservation. God's in control of his creation. He preserves it, all of his properties. Um, and to, he's in control. B, let's, uh, let's hit concurrence, and we'll end with this. Here's what we're going to do. We'll start with then, because the question that comes after concurrence is, then what about evil? What about suffering? We'll tackle that first thing when we come back next week. But let's talk about concurrence. Is that God cooperates with created things in every action, directing their distinct properties, distinctive properties, to cause them to act as they do. That's concurrence, God working concurrently with his own creation that he created. So what is the key word in that definition? Cause. Closet, right? And what's the other keyword? Cooperates. 
he cooperates, and then even, okay, let's go with third keyword. There's lots of keywords. <laughs> Keep going, these are great. Directing. With the directing. Keyword, directing. Plural, directing. So think about this definition. He directs, he cooperates, and he causes, but especially direct and cause. That has a certainly more of a, that's an, that's an active, not just passive or working. But he directs and causes properties, and he causes them to act as they do. That, that's, that's, we've got to remember that in the definition of concurrence. So let's talk about some of the things that God directs and causes. Concurrence means this. The inanimate creation. So we're not going to read all these verses. Uh, but uh, for Matthew 5.45 says, For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. He's control over the inanimate objects in his creation. This is not just metaphorical. But he really does. Has control over the rain that falls and the snow has control over all of these things. You can read, there's a whole lot of verses that Gruden gave that you can go back and we won't spend time reading these. There's also control over uh, animals. Matthew 6, 26 says, Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more of value than they? And so God's control over his animal creation as well. Let's keep going. Uh, what seems like perhaps random events, Proverbs 16, 33 says, The lot is cast into the lap but it's every decision is from the Lord. And so that's something to think about, too, that, uh, that God controls what we may think are just random chance events. But there's no aspect of his creation that he is not directing and causing. Uh, let's keep going. Events that are fully caused by God and caused by a creature. This is what Gruden meant by this. So here's the question. Uh, think about a farmer and the crops. Who, who grows the crops? Ultimately, God's in control of that. So you could say that the farmer's the one that got out the John Deere, plowed that field, prepped it, planted the seed, went back through and sprayed it for bugs and maybe a little fertilizer, then went through with the harvester, gathered it. So that all those all that corn is now in the silo because the farmer worked hard to do it, correct? So that those are all true statements, absolutely. Yet we know that it that the farmer did not put that seed in the ground and then stand there and make that and create all of that so that when you put that dead seed into a ground, dirt, and add water, that it actually grows in sun and rain nourishes it. The farmer had nothing to do with any of that. Benefited, that's from God's creation. And so they are. Now, Grudem makes it a point that, that both of those are true. We can argue whether we are, where we fall on that or not. But the point is, ultimately, I think, the take away from that is God was ultimately in control of all of that, who gave the farmer the knowledge and the strong back and the mind and the work ethic and the ability to do all that has provided all of that. See, the same the other, other, the carpenter builds a house, right? The same thing, an artist and a painting. So who created that painting? So it came from the brain of the artist, which was uh, created by God himself, correct? And so that's what it comes, comes back to. But so there is some working together, but ultimately it is God who does all. Uh, God directs the affairs of the nations of the world. So Psalms 22, 28. Um, you know what, let's do this. Romans 13. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Um, I didn't put this on it. First Peter 2 says, Peter writes, Fear God, honor the emperor. you got to remember that emperor was uh, probably Nero was a sick and twisted individual. And so I think this is our, here's my one ethics. Here's our one, we'll, we'll just kind of veer off into ethics for just a minute. So I think this has a lot of good advice and words for us living in a very polarized political culture. <coughs> now We have to remember that, first of all, that the Christian building the kingdom of God is not a government. It has nothing to do with whatever side of the aisle. Uh, that's not what our primary goal and mandate as followers of Christ. And we got to remember that whoever currently is in power in the world is not there by accident. we got to really think that through. That God has given design and purpose to that, and that is from directly from the scriptures. And so now we can go off onto this, oh boy, here I did it, now we got hands coming up. Is we just have to remember that, men, is that they are designed by God. It's not like, oops, I didn't mean, God does not sit back and say, well, wait a minute, how did that person suddenly get into power? I'm just thinking, we see uh, on TV all the time showing different countries and all the bad things happening. We 
sort of had to cut and he got me, that guy who'd been in charge, and that guy was really messing with the country and messing with the people. Uh, it, we kind of think that's a mistake, the guy shouldn't be there. And what about America? What about the Revolutionary War? And when you think about it, it's, it's some questions that are really deep. So it's, sometimes it's hard. God really did these things. Do we really believe that? I think sometimes we, it's kind of hard to believe that. Yeah. We shouldn't be doing this. Yeah. Right. So here's the easy part, and there's the hard part to your question. You could say, I'm a Democrat Christian living in America. Trump, seriously, God, what are you thinking? I am a conservative Christian. I could say, President Obama, come on, seriously, God, wait, really? Or that's not a difficult thing to talk about. Let's say this, what about Adolf Hitler? Wait, really? Wow, millions of the suffering that came through that. So, so let's so put a pause on that because we're going to talk about suffering and we'll get to that for next week's chapter. So this is, I've been struggling with this throughout the chapter because in all of those things, and like you talked about your daughter too, I think about God's sovereignty, and God's, um, I can't think of what God's chapter, uh, providence. providence, and they're so close. And it's how do I distinguish them? Like it, it, because, or should I? Because we talk about God's sovereignty. He has sovereignty over my life. He also has providence over my life. And, and he has sovereignty over creation, providence, okay, throughout. How are they distinguished? Okay, so you're saying it's sovereignty and providence. Are, are they the same terms? thing? I take them to be the same, but if somebody else has a different opinion on that, we can discuss that. I view them as one and the same. I think what's hard is just trying to process in my human thinking what that means. Yeah. And so right. you, I, I gave the example of personal and my daughter. Well, I'm not the only man in this room who has watched their children go through horrific health issues. And I, my, I know that some of you are dealing with things far worse than what my daughter's had to deal with. And so, but then let's take that to its bigger. So we ran out of time this morning, so I want no one ever to walk out of here with despair because we really needed to talk about the question of, of evil and suffering right in tandem with this. But we're going to have to take a week-long pause just because we're out of time. And I don't want to rush through this either. So be patient. We are going to come back. Um, we are going to come back next week. And that's the first thing we're going to talk about. But then the case is, what about... How does that work then? Because there's been unimaginable human suffering and evil throughout all of human history since the fall uh, in, in the early chapters of Genesis. And so what does that mean? If God's in control, then why? How do I process that as a human being? We need to be, we, we need to wrestle with that. All right, coming in with this, I'm in with two more slides and we gotta, we gotta wrap it up. Uh, God's in control of every aspect of our lives from giving us our daily bread the heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. So there's nothing in our lives that God is not in control of. It's his. This is his creation. It's his plan, his purpose. And uh, we just need to remember that. And uh, I'm going to hold off on this because this is where we're going to start next week, the question of evil. And what is the question? Why is there evil then? That's it. That's the simplest question. Why? If God's in control of why? Why is, why is there so much human suffering? That's what we're going to stop with, men. Thank you. Uh, it's, uh, we're going to hit the ground running. Please don't leave in despair. I wanted to at least address this in context that we just said, but we're going to have to wait until next week. So thank you, guys. All right. Thanks, John. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Uh, one, if you're, if you're not getting emails from me, uh, I've got a notebook back there. Just write your name and uh, your email down. Uh, that way you'll get the weekly emails from me, so uh, it'll be a big kind of uh, of where we're at <clears throat> in our study, uh, as well as uh, a link to Pete's videos and a link to the uh, Ring Central, in case you can't be here. Uh, Aaron was driving here this morning and didn't want to miss me getting a class, uh, so he was on there. But um, uh, last year we had a guy from uh, the Philippines, right? Who's in the Philippines? Yes, uh, right, from my period of living in the Philippines. I believe. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so um, we uh, we became, overnight, we become like the, the third largest campus uh, in, <laughs> in uh, Village Bible Church, which was pretty cool. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so 
Um, if you don't get the emails from me, notebook back there. Um, also, uh, we have our mentor tree coming up. If uh, if you haven't signed up yet, uh, do so. Um, I know there's a uh, early bird rate. I don't know when that ends. Um, it's already passed. Early bird rate's already passed. Thanks, Chad. Um, uh, there was a link on last week's email. Uh, I'll put another link on this week's email as well. Um, and uh, that will be the first or the 30th, depending on when you go, through the 3rd or something like that. So a, a lot of us go on Thursday night, and uh, then we cook on fire on, on Friday morning and Friday afternoon for breakfast and lunch. And uh, it's a really great time. Really great time of fellowship and getting out in the North Woods and a and, uh, really good time of uh, teaching and, and, uh, and worship as well. Um, am I missing anything? All right. Um, all right. Let me uh, let me close this in prayer, and then uh, then we'll uh, get after it. Uh, Father God, Lord, I thank you uh, for this morning. I thank you for uh, your sovereignty, Lord, your providence, uh, your control over what's happening in our world. Lord, nothing uh, nothing passes over your proverbial desk uh, without you knowing and understanding and uh, directing all of those things. Father, I, I pray that uh, that we would not leave in despair this morning, uh, but we would leave with confidence knowing that you have our uh, paths directed, Lord, and in that you love us um, in whatever you're doing. I pray that, uh, uh, Lord, that you would be glorified out of our lives uh, and that... Uh, that you would keep us safe until next week. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so uh, emails back there if, if you're not getting my emails. Um, otherwise, I'll see you next week. All right.